My name is Rafael Busso. I'm a professor of physics at Berkeley. And we're here to talk about the physics of the observer, uh, which seems like a bad idea, because in science we're generally trained to think of the observer as a nuisance, as an external thing. Um, we need somebody to do the actual observing of the, of the objective phenomena that we are interested in. Um, we, we think that those phenomena are in some sense absolute. They would be there even if the observer wasn't there. Um, and we like to go after simple things to understand the laws of nature. We like to dig out where uh, they're most fundamental and what phenomena are simple in terms of those fundamental laws. Um, observers are definitely not simple. They're very complicated. We're extremely hard to explain from any fundamental perspective. And so our usual attitude is to keep those messy observers away from our beautiful laws of physics. And, um, attempt to formulate these laws without any regard for who is actually doing all the hard work of observing phenomena from which we deduce those laws. Um, and this anti-observer discrimination can be a really good idea sometimes. Um, there is a tendency uh, to get carried away with a kind of mysticism, get carried away in the other direction where we, we think observers are somehow deeply important where they aren't. We should certainly make an effort to explain things without appealing to that sort of thing. And I think a wonderful example uh, are a lot of early discussions of, of Schrodinger's famous cat, which um, we connect to a quantum phenomenon where we can have a sum of two states, let's say up or down, or a radioactive atom is decayed or not decayed. We can add those together in quantum mechanics, and we can concoct a device which leads to that spilling out into what we're used to as a classical world with a cat that's alive plus a cat that's dead as being the actual state of this box. Um, and, and, and in the early discussions, there was a sort of tendency to describe uh, the resolution of that as the intrusion of a conscious observer who opens the box and looks at the cat. And only then does the cat get the privilege of being either alive or dead. Um, and, and so that, of course, you know, leads to you know, wonderful uh, flowery descriptions of how important consciousness is and so on. And that's just, you know, getting carried away. It's very easy to explain uh, why you don't see such a state. You don't need any fancy conscious observers. You just need one light particle to bounce off that cat. And you not keeping track of that light particle is enough for that cat to be in a state which is either dead or alive, but definitely not the sum of the two. Um, and, and so more generally, uh, something that's sort of counterintuitive to a classical physicist, usually the air in the room is not important to the behavior of this chair. The light that bounces off of it doesn't move it very much. But when we want to understand why the world seems classical to us um, and why we don't see cats that are both alive and dead at the same time, uh, the environment is very important. We have to take into account that constantly little particles are bouncing off of these microscopic objects. And it's very hard to keep them away from them. And so when we do science as we're used to doing it, what we actually do is we work very hard to make that not happen, at least if we're doing quantum physics. We're on the outside building a gigantic detector like this. We're looking in. We're looking at some particle collision that happens in that detector. When we smash those particles together, we make sure they don't interact with anything else. There are no light particles bouncing off of them. There's nothing moving off to the side. We keep the system really well isolated. And only after we get them to do what we want these particles to do and collide and make you know, new particles that we want to discover, then we send them into these detectors. And these detectors measure the outcome. And these detectors are big. And so the outcome immediately decoheres in our language. It becomes a classical outcome um, that we don't argue about anymore. Um, the reason that we should worry about this anyway um, I think it's immediately obvious when we realize that we don't just do those kinds of experiments. We're not always on the outside looking in. When we look at the universe, when we look at, at uh, our galaxy, at, at, at stars, at the, at the cosmos as a whole, we're inside looking out. We're very much part of the system. And in particular, whatever nasty little environmental effects have happened, they've already happened. There's nothing we can do about it anymore. This is indeed why the universe looks so classical to us. But we're a part of it. 
Shouldn't that make us worry a little bit? Well, here's one way to try to make that worry a little sharper. Um, let's imagine that here somewhere in that, in, the, in that galaxy, that's us. And we're performing a Schrodinger's cat experiment. And the cat is either alive or dead because it's really hard to keep the cat away from little light particles, photons, or air particles. They bounce off of it. And we can't keep track of those particles. They're gone. And so to us, the cat is either alive or dead. We never see a superposition of the two. But unbeknownst to us, there is a giant, very powerful spider that has surrounded the whole galaxy. And to which the galaxy is like those little particles we smash together in our particle collider. And the, the spider is like that enormous detector that absorbs what's coming out and measures the outcome. Fundamentally, there is absolutely no difference between those situations. It's just that this is a particularly large number of particles, and this is a particularly large detector, if you imagine it's as big as the galaxy. Uh, but other than that, there's no reason for the laws of physics to suddenly be completely different just because we're looking at this or that bigger distance scale. And so to this spider, you know, it takes 100,000 years for even light to travel from the center of the galaxy to the outside. So we may think that this cat has decohered. It's either dead or alive because light particles bounced off of it. To the spider, all of that stuff is still in here. It's still very much part of the system. It hasn't act interacted with anything that the spider would call an external environment. And so, excuse me, uh, to the spider, the cat very much remains both dead and alive. It remains in this superposition. In fact, the entire galaxy is in some very sophisticated superposition of two different states, one in which the cat is dead and people are crying on Earth and uh, you know, there are certain light particles bouncing off, uh, off of the Earth and into space that would have bounced differently had the spider been alive. Um, and another state where the spider actually is alive and all those particles are moving differently. That's what the spider sees. Okay. Now we can push this a little bit further. We can imagine that the spider decides to make a measurement that's analogous to an environment or us measuring a cat and figuring out, is this thing dead or is it alive? Again, there's nothing in the laws of physics that we know that would prevent the spider from making such a measurement, though it would be an extraordinary delicate extraordinarily delicate and difficult measurement to perform. Then I never stopped anybody from thinking about it. Um, so the spider can perform this measurement. And the worst thing about this story is that quantum mechanics tells us that the spider need not get the same answer that we got. The spider might actually find that the cat is alive if we found that it was dead. How can this be possible? Well. It's not possible in normal situations. If I measure an atom, and it turns out to, have to be in a certain energy level or have some property that we care about, okay, and I found out, okay, it's in that energy level. If you go ahead and now look at that atom, you'll find the same energy level. Why is that? It's because we share an environment. There are things that we both don't keep track of and that therefore play the role of environment. There's all these photons that bounce off of my apparatus's needle that neither you nor I are keeping track of capturing, having the ability to access and measure. That's why we all agree on what happened. But if this spider literally doesn't let anything escape from the galaxy and performs a careful measurement in what a physicist would call the basis of spider, uh, sorry, cat alive, rest of the galaxy happy, uh, and cat dead, rest of the galaxy sad, um, the spider could have a different outcome from the one that we found. There's no contradiction here because that measurement really accesses all of the degrees of freedom, all of the particles that exist in the galaxy, uh, all at the same time. It's a very radical and intrusive measurement that effectively can erase all the records that we have and all our memories, which are just special cases of, of records, of outcomes of experiments. But it does make you worry what actually happens in the world. Is that a good question to ask? Is that one of those things that we're going to have to learn to give up asking because nature just doesn't behave in this way in general, even though 
effectively in practice? It's a useful wor word that something happened? Maybe. So here's a minor attempt using cosmology um, to recover at least an approximate notion of things that objectively happen. This notion is called the causal patch. And it's what an observer could see if the observer lives infinitely long, or at least until the universe ends. So we're not going to constrain the observer by boring human life, lifetimes or things like that. The only thing that we're going to constrain is that the observer gets to see only things that can reach the observer traveling as fast as the speed of light. So we don't get to violate the laws of physics. That's this shaded region here. I'm making time go up and space go sideways and light can travel only as fast as 45 degrees in this particular way of drawing things. It can't go, for example, this fast. So I can't see what's happening here if I'm this observer because it never reaches me. Now, this still sounds silly. If I give myself an infinite amount of time, you might think I can see infinitely far eventually. Um, but in fact, in, in real cosmology, space and time are bent in funny ways, and that can prevent signals from reaching us even if we wait for an infinite amount of time. And so this singles out a kind of region of space-time that any one observer, no matter how sophisticated, can have access to. Even the spider can't do better than this with all its great powers. Here's another example. This would be a black hole. You can fall into the black hole. You can decide to stay outside. Those two observers really see different parts of the universe. Nobody sees all of this universe. Here's something called the multiverse, where the universe has very many different regions of different effective physical laws. Again, one observer might see a sequence of transitions, what I call phase transitions, between different physical laws. But nobody sees the whole thing. Now, what does it have to do with things happening? What does that have to do with our spider problem? Well, even if you keep track of everything inside your causal patch, which is already a lot to ask for, the fact that the patch is not everything means there's a kind of preferred environment. There's a, kind of, there's a set of things which nobody, no matter how smart and sophisticated they are, can keep track of, namely any particle or galaxy that crosses out of this causal patch. That's really gone. And so that gives us something to fall back to. So here's a history of things that might happen in a causal patch. Something happened here, and certain traces of it start propagating outward nearly at the speed of light, so they, say a light particle that bounces off. Well, once those light particles leave the causal patch, they're gone, and we can say that this thing really happened and no spider can come and tell us otherwise. So the environment in this picture is whatever leaves the patch. It's whatever moves to space-time regions from which we can never receive a signal, no matter how long we wait. And so in that sense, things can still happen in an objective way in cosmology. Now, I put little asterisks here because the cosmology itself ultimately will be described by quantum physics. And there will be a small probability for even a region as large as the region that we can see of the universe to undergo such strong quantum fluctuations that it makes no longer any sense to speak of this causal patch, that it just disappears. And so at best, what we accomplish by this is an extremely accurate but not perfect definition of what happens. I just suspect, personally, that that's as well as we can do unless we happen to live in a universe where we eventually gain access to an infinite space-time volume. Thanks very much. <laughs>